So we're starting a brand new series. Jesus told us that the greatest commandment of all time was this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. But when he was asked that question, he couldn't stop talking there. He had to keep talking and he said, and the second commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. When he first said those words, there was a guy standing next to him and he said to him, Jesus, who's my neighbor? And the text tells us that he actually was trying to justify himself. See, what he was trying to do is he was trying to get Jesus to say, your neighbor is a box. There's a box and a few people fit into the neighbor box. And those are the people that you need to love. This guy wanted to narrow his love circle down to the smallest group possible so that he could love them. And he didn't have to worry about the people who were outside of that neighbor circle. So he said, Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this amazing story. You've, you've heard it before. It's sometimes called the Good Samaritan. But it's a story about how two people who are enemies with each other, one guy gets beaten up and the other guy rescues him. And this guy who's a Samaritan, who's kind of an enemy of the Jewish people, he comes and sees this Jewish guy laying on the ground and he cares for him and he nurtures him. And then at the end of the story, Jesus says, he flips the question around back at the guy. He says, who was a neighbor to the man lying in the ditch? He turns the whole question upside down because, see, the guy said, who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, no, who is being a neighbor to the other person? He, he flips it around. And so then this guy says, well, it's the Samaritan. And Jesus says, you got it right. Now go and you do the same. In other words, be a neighbor. Now, our problem today is exactly the opposite of that guy. That guy's problem was that he wanted to take the, this message that you need to love your neighbor and narrow it down to a small group of people. But we've heard Jesus' stories. We've heard his teaching. And we know that he takes this love command and he spreads it out globally. Everybody is part of this neighbor community because you're the one who's the neighbor. And so everybody that you're around, it's the neighbor situation because you're their neighbor. Jesus expands it. Our problem today is that we know this about Jesus. We know this about his requirement to expand the love command to everybody. And so what we do is we say this in our hearts. We say, I love everyone. And we take the love command and rather than narrowing it down to a small box, we spread it out so thin that it's meaningless. Because we say Jesus wants us to love the whole world. And since he wants us to love the whole world, that means that I'm supposed to feel the same amount of love towards you as I feel towards the stranger in Albania. And so that means I don't really need to love you because I, I don't really love them. I just, you know, feel warm and fuzzy sometimes about these other people. And so that's what we do. We spread it so thin that it's almost meaningless at that point in time. The guy said, I want a small box, and we do the opposite. We spread it thin, and it means nothing. But I'm wondering if when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he didn't actually mean love people. We do this. We say, man, I, I love the person, but I hate their sin, so I'm not going to hang out with them. We do this. We say, Jesus tells me I got to love you, but I don't have to like you. We do this. We're all in a church together and the most loving thing I can do is tell you how you're wrong. That's the kind of stuff that we do. You know, that's the kind of stuff that church people, Christian people type people do. That's the stuff. And what we're doing is we're spreading it so thin that it's meaningless. And I think, what if Jesus was actually telling us he wanted us to love each other? More than that, what if when he uses the word neighbor, he means your actual neighbors? How many of us, don't raise your hand, could qualify for that command by saying, everyone in my neighborhood knows how much I love them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, let's not even go there because that's just a dangerous road. But here's the deal. What we've done is we've taken the command and we've made it so spiritual that it's meaningless. And so I'm going to ask us to maybe reconsider that it's practically true, that it's practically what God is calling us to do. And that we need to actually show love and why not start with the people God put in, next, in the house next to yours, in the apartment above yours, below yours. Turn down your music just a little bit and let's be nice to the other people. So here's the situation. We're going to be talking about this. The series is called Like a Good Neighbor. 
And uh, I just thought the logo was cute with the State Farmy kind of thing. But anyway, so I think this is what we're going to be, what we're going to need to focus on for a little bit of time. We need to figure out what it takes to be a good neighbor. And as I began to think through this series, I thought, man, I don't want to start this series on Mother's Day because what I'm supposed to do on Mother's Day is give this nice flowing message about how awesome our moms are. You know, or maybe I've done this before in the past. I, I don't really like to, to make Mother's Day into Mother's Day. I like to make it more into a woman's day because there are lots of women who aren't moms and that's cool. So let's just make it a ladies day. So I've done messages like that before. Listen to last year's message and it'll be all about, you know, something about how awesome women are and stuff like that. And, and it was a good message. I'm not saying anything bad about that, but, but I figured I, I want us to stay on this mission idea. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with this? How are we going to take our next steps all together? And so I'm thinking mothers and being a good neighbor, and it suddenly hit me. Your neighborhood needs a mom. Now, let me illustrate. Let me tell you where this is coming from. When I was in Denver, I was a student at a school called Denver Seminary. I was married, and my wife Jennifer was bringing home the money so that we could pay for the school. And She's still bringing home the money, but that's okay. So we're... <laughs> We're in this situation back there in Denver, and uh, it, it's working out well for us. She's a programmer at a company called Evolving Systems. Now, Evolving Systems was a tech company, and this is at the end of the 90s. So this is like 98, 99, something like that. And in the technology world, there was money growing on trees. Now, this wasn't one of those internet boom and bust kind of companies where they got lots of money and then it went, bleh, went broke. This was an actual company that made some good stuff. In fact, the project that my wife was working on, you might have heard of this, was a project, a programming thing that you had to do to allow one phone company to transfer a phone number to another phone company. Are you familiar with this? People actually keep their same number even though they're changing phone companies. Did you know you couldn't do that at one point in time? My wife made it happen for you. Go and thank her. <laughs> so... Evolving Systems was a company that was writing the software that made this thing happen. It's called Local Number Portability. I won't get into all that, but it was cool. Anyway, so, she, so she's in this company. The company was doing quite well. It was making a lot of money. And so they hired moms. Yes, mothers to be office moms. And I, she came home one day and she told me, we got a mom. And I was like, huh? You got a Bob? You got a... You got a, a a mob? A bomb? What did you say? No, a mom. We got a mom in our office. I was like, what is this? So they hired three ladies to be moms in the office. If you were in your office and you were doing something and you got a paper cut, <laughs> you'd go to the mom. <laughs> She'd give you a band-aid. And sometimes the mom would bring cookies and brownies to the office. And sometimes the mom would have a, a refrigerator in her little office and you could go into the office and you could, you could go into the little refrigerator and take out a soda or a candy bar or something. Apparently this mom didn't care how you ate. It, <laughs> it wasn't anything about, you know, broccoli and all that kind of stuff. She was a different kind of just, you know, helpful, supportive kind of encouraging kind of mom without any regard to your health. But so, <laughs> so they had a mom. They actually paid these ladies to be moms in the office. And I thought, well, that's just awesome. And then, then all of a sudden it began to click with me. What if Christians were like that in our neighborhoods? Maybe you were in a neighborhood that had a neighborhood mom. You know, maybe it was your mom and you always felt bad that all these other kids were coming over to your house eating your food. Or maybe it was someone else who had the mom and you were always over at their house thinking how awesome it was that you were at that kid's house eating his food and, and stuff. I don't know what it was, but, but we need to have that kind of back. And I'm going to say, I think your neighborhood needs a mom. In fact, I'm not the only one who thinks so. Because as I was looking in the scriptures this last week, I found a passage that I was familiar with before, but I saw in a new way. It's quoted in Luke. It's also quoted in Matthew. We're going to look at it in Matthew. And Jesus says something really interesting. He says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Such an interesting phrase there, but you can almost hear Jesus' angst in that verse. Because he's saying to the city of Jerusalem, I longed to mother you, and yet you've rejected it. And this is fascinating to me, because listen, Jesus is a dude. He was a carpenter. I imagine a little built 
You know, when you're swinging hammers and doing stuff with wood and stuff, you get a little bit more bicep than I have. And so Jesus was probably a pretty strong guy. And yet he's using mother language to refer to his desire for a relationship with the people of Jerusalem. Now, it's a fascinating thing. He's not just talking about some bird protecting other birds. He's talking about a hen, a chicken. Jesus wants to be like a chicken protecting chicks. That's a weird metaphor to me, but it's definitely a mothering metaphor. And so what you get, you get two things coming out of this. Let me invite you. You can jot these down. There's no blanks to fill in or whatever for this. But here's, here's two thoughts. One is Jesus wants to have a mothering kind of relationship with people. Secondly, those people need a mothering kind of relationship with him, even though they don't know it. They've rejected it time and time again. They rejected the prophets before Jesus, and now they're about to reject him. He's about ready to go to the cross and be crucified by these people in Jerusalem. They're going to kill him, and they don't even know what they really need. Jesus is like, how I wish you knew what you needed because I want to just be like a mother to you. Very interesting metaphor. So what I want to do with you today is I want to take you in two directions. It's really the same direction, just two different distances. See, what we're going to do is we're going to go and take Jesus' metaphor and find out where it started. And we're going to go all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy to figure out where this mothering metaphor starts of the wings. We're going to go all the way back to Deuteronomy and see where it begins, but then we're also going to stay in Matthew 23 and just look a little bit before that to find out why Jesus said it then and why Jesus said it to those people. So first, I want to give you the blank, and it's this, that God wants to mother his people, not smother, mother I'm turning it into a verb because God wants to have a kind of a mothering relationship with his people. God wants to mother people. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. If you grab the version live event, you can get yourself there in a couple taps. Otherwise, it'll be up here on the screen. It says this, in a desert land, he found him. So let me explain the pronouns. Who's the he and who's the him? This is Moses singing a song. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 32. It's the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and Moses is singing a song to the people of Jerusalem. I mean, not the people of Jerusalem, the people of, of Judah, the, the Israelites, the, the descendants of Jacob and Abraham and Isaac, those guys. So he's singing a song over them, and he's referring to them as him. Because just in the verse before that, he used the word Jacob to refer to all the people. Now, let me remind you of why they're there in the desert. See, they came out of Egypt. You probably saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, or one of these things. And, you know, Moses is doing the deal where they cross the Red Sea and they come out of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. They come out of Egypt. They're wandering in the desert for 40 years. They're wandering in the desert so long so that all the people who came out of Egypt die except for three. Moses a guy named Joshua, and a guy named Caleb. Those are the only three guys who are still alive who came out of Egypt. Everyone else has died, and now the people who are left are people who were born in the desert, born in the last 40 years. In other words, they met God in the desert. When they were in the desert is when they met him. And so this is a song where Moses is talking to the people about God's relationship with them and how eventually they're going to fail God. But we're not there yet. This is just at the initial part of it. In a desert land, he, talking about God, found him, talking about the people of Israel. In a barren and howling waste, he, God, shielded him, the people of Israel, and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. Now, in this song, there are two metaphors that are going on that I want to draw your attention to. The first metaphor is this metaphor of the apple of the eye. Now, that's not literally what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew behind this, when Moses first sings the song, literally says this, the little man of his eye. That's a weird phrase, I know. That's why it was translated the way it was. But here's, here's what it means. If you look really closely into someone's eye, what you'll see is in their pupil, you'll see yourself. You'll see a reflection of yourself as a little tiny person in that other person's eye. 
And so the Hebrews referred to the little man in the eye to mean the person's pupil, the most sensitive part, the most meaningful part of a person's eye. Anything happens right around here and it's bad. And so then the idiom, then the metaphor became that that's the part of you you protect the most. And so in English, a number of years ago, the idiom was common, the apple of the eye, to mean that thing that you treasure the most, the thing that is most precious to you. We don't really use that metaphor as much anymore, but it still lingers because it's close to the Hebrew metaphor. But here's what it's communicating. God is looking over his people as the most precious thing in the world to him, his treasured thing. Listen, someone, someone can bump your arm, but no one's going to bump your eye. Someone can poke you in the ribs, but they're not going to poke you in the eye if you have anything to say about it. You're going to protect that. That's some serious protection going on there. But the second metaphor is this metaphor of the eagle. Now, I tried to figure out uh, what this all was about. I did a little bit of research this week. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not an ornithologist. I'm not really big into bird watching and, and whatnot. So, you know, what I, I, I went to Wikipedia and I, I looked at a couple different articles and I looked up some other things about eagles and how they fly and how they teach their infants to fly, the eaglets. And I even watched some YouTube clips on some eaglets learning how to fly. And, and in all of that, I, I learned a couple things. The first thing is that when an eaglet is ready to fly and the parent knows the eaglet is ready to fly, what the parent will do is it'll stop giving them food. The parent eagle will stop giving the child eagle, the eaglet, food. And then, this is crazy, the parent eagle will taunt the eaglet with food by taking food in its claws and fly just high enough over the nest that the eaglet can't get to it. So the, the parent eagle will like take its gigantic wings and just kind of flap over top of the baby eagle. And then the baby eagle will see the food and it'll try to get to it and it'll see the parent flapping. So it'll start flapping its wings and it'll get like two inches above the nest and eventually high enough that it can grab some of the food and fall back down. And so the parent eagle continues to do this thing until the eaglet is ready to jump out of the nest finally and use those wings that it's been flapping to go and soar. But in this metaphor, something interesting happens. It stirs up its nest, it hovers over its young, but this eagle spreads its wings to catch them. 40% of eaglets on their first flight do not survive. Because in nature, they jump out of the nest and that's it. You fly or you don't. You sink or swim, so to speak. 40% don't even survive. But this metaphor is different. This is a metaphor of an eagle that would spread its wings and dive bomb underneath the falling eaglet to catch the eaglet on its wings and then glide to a place of safety and drop him off. That's phenomenal to me. That's a, that's a different kind of thing than I'm personally used to because, see, this is the difference between dads and moms. This is the difference between dads and moms. Dads think like this. Sure, I had a pocket knife when I was a kid and it didn't kill me. <laughs> moms think like this. Are you nuts? She's two years old. <laughs> That's the way moms think. And guys are just like, whatever. So here's the situation. For, between me and my wife, I was amazed when I was... When I was a new dad, and I had like children, infant children, and toddlers in my household, um, that when they would get hurt, they wouldn't run to me. See, for some reason, I had this crazy idea that when they, would, then when they were hurt, they would run to the strongest one in the room. I was the only one there. But uh, <laughs> they, they wouldn't run to me. They wouldn't do any of that stuff. And then over time, I began to watch how my wife was with the children. See, I would be like, you're hurt, come and get me. She was like, you're hurt, I'll come and get you. And she would swoop into the situation and she would wrap them up and she would take them and I'd be like, oh, it's a, it's a scratch, you know? Because I'm thinking more like the Monty Python guy. He's lost an arm and a leg and it's just a flesh wound. My kids could be lying there without any limbs and I'd be like, oh, they'll be fine. I'll take them to the hospital, sew it back on. But she swoops in she swoops in, and then over time, guess what they did? When they were hurt, they go to her. 
And I see God telling us the exact same thing about how he wants to relate to us. He says, I want to be like that eagle that swoops in and catches you when you're falling and glides to a safe place and drops you off so that you feel secure enough you can do it again until you fly. That's the kind of thing that God wants with you. That's the kind of relationship that God wants with you. Now, this metaphor was adopted by David. King David, the poet king, when he wrote the book of Psalms, he didn't write all the Psalms, but he wrote a lot of them. And when he wrote them, he adopted this metaphor of a bird with its wings and its young. But he did something really interesting to it. So I want to share with you Psalm 17, verses 9, excuse me, 6 through 9. It'll be on the screen. David is writing this and he says, I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love, you who save by your right hand, those who take refuge in you from their foes. And then he says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who are out to destroy me, from my mortal enemies who surround me. He's pulling this metaphor directly from Deuteronomy. Because he's got both the apple and the wings. He's got them both there. He says, shield me, keep me as the apple of your eye. Protect me, consider me to be precious, God. But then he does something interesting with the wings metaphor. In this place, God isn't swooping in. In this place, God is just sheltering. He's just putting his wings around David and just holding him there keeping him safe. The image is of a bird that would just guard its young. And so David takes this metaphor that was very active and he, he pulls out the nurturing element of it, the security element to it. And he uses the same exact metaphor and he repeats it in Psalm 57 and Psalm 61 and Psalm 63 and it shows up again in Psalm 91. I don't know if David wrote that one because it's not attributed to him in the text. But Psalm 91, it shows up again. So here's the first thing I want you to know about God wanting to mother you. It's that, this, that God wants to be your refuge and your security. He wants to be your refuge and your security. And those two words are important. Refuge is where you go when you're in trouble. Refuge is where you run when you're hurting. Security is why you can walk out the door again tomorrow, knowing that there's still safety, knowing that there's still someone who's got your back. Refuge is when you run home. Security is when you go out the door and say, I always know I'll be safe. I always have a safe place I can always come back to. I believe God wants to be your refuge and your reason for feeling a sense of security wherever you go in life. Listen, maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you've never viewed him as your refuge. Maybe your picture of God, and, and this is an okay picture, it's a valid picture, is one of God being our father. And that's a very biblical picture. That's the number one picture of God. But maybe your own relationship with your own father or other fathers that you've known has been a little bit tainted, a little bit weird. We're even going to get to that in a little bit. But, but you need to know that God wants to be your refuge. He wants to be the one who swoops in and grabs hold of you and shelters you and cares for you. If you've never turned to him like that, do it today. And say, God, whatever it is, I'm yours. I'm in but Jesus takes the same concept. Jesus takes this same concept and he does something really interesting with it. In Matthew 23, we were already at verse 37, but let's go back to verse 13 and see the context of why Jesus said what he said about wanting to mother the people of Jerusalem. In Matthew 23, verse 13, it says this, Woe to you! Teachers of the law. Well, that, wait a minute, that seems awfully harsh. Uh, woe is this word that means you're going to be judged. You're going to be taken down. You're, in, you're on some thin ice. Woe is one of these dangerous, scary kinds of words. And why does Jesus, the guy who wants to be kind of motherly, why does he begin with these woe words? 
Well, let me give you the blank, and then I'll read the rest, and we'll explain it. The blank is this. People need to be mothered. You can even put in parentheses after that, whether they know it or not. People need to be mothered, whether they know it or not. Now, I want you to see what the leaders of God's people hear from Jesus in these verses. So he says, Woe! Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Jesus says, listen, you teachers of the law, you are the leaders of the people, and you are keeping people from knowing me, because he's already told us that he is the way to know God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light, no one comes to the Father except through me. So if the Pharisees, if the teachers of the law, if the leaders are keeping people from Jesus, they're keeping people from their Father in heaven. They're keeping people from the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, you're doing that now. You keep other people from the kingdom and you don't enter it. Verse 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you've succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Which means you Pharisees are sending out missionaries, but after you find a person, you begin to turn them into a worse person than you. Verse 16. Woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and, everyone, and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. And what's this all about? A lot of people think this is about swearing. But it's not, actually. You see, what's really happening here is the Pharisees have been making some really stupid rules. Just really mindless rules. They'll say stuff like this. Listen, if you swore by the temple, that's a non-binding swear. But if you swear by the gold on the temple, that is a binding swear. What? It's almost like what we do in our society, where we'll say, you can sit in this witness booth, and you can lie your socks off until you put your hand on the Bible and say, I do solemnly swear that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, or whatever it is they make people say these days that they probably don't use the Bible and, and use God's name anymore. I don't even know, because I haven't been in a witness stand, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to clarify there. So, I'm not sure how that goes, but we, we somehow say your word means nothing unless you do some type of symbolic thing with your hand and your, your right hand and whatever. It's, we do the same kind of deal, and that's what these, these guys were doing back then. They're like, okay, so here's some things that you can do and get away with it, and here are other things that you can do and you can't get away with it. It's just plain dumb. That's Jesus' point. These are dumb rules that these leaders are coming up with, and they're telling people they need to obey them. Like it matters whether or not you swear by one thing or another thing. Your swearing doesn't mean squat. Either you're telling the truth or you're not telling the truth. And because you use the magic word swear, it doesn't change it. Your kid says to you, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. Oh, well, now I believe you. <laughs> now that changes, changes everything. I didn't know you were going to swear. Well, yeah, sure. There, you're cool now. We're all good. Okay, the cookies are back. So, that's Jesus' point. Now, let's keep reading, okay? Verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Jesus' point there is that these guys are giving a tenth of everything that they own. It's an Old Testament principle called the tithe. It's a principle that our church upholds. It's a principle that I and my family uphold. It's a principle that says I take the first 10% of everything that God gives to me, and I give it back to God. It's just a general rule of thumb. I take the first 10% that God gives to me, I give it back to Him. So these guys were taking the first 10% of every single detail of their life. 
If they got a spice from the market, they would take 10% and give it back to God. And they would tithe all the tiny little details of their lives, but they didn't pay attention to justice and mercy and caring for people. And this is what's going on. They're paying attention to the details of their religion rather than the heart of what God really wants from people. Let's keep going. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, they care more about their reputation than they do about their integrity. They care more about how people perceive them and their religiousness than they do about actually living it out. Let's finish it up. He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers. Oh, I skipped verse 29. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we'd lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourself that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. A little hint. Jesus says, all your ancestors killed all the prophets that God sent them. And in a couple weeks, you're going to kill me. Finish what your parents started. Here I am. He's just pulling that card on them. Verse 33. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. And here's where he says it. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. So Jesus wants to do a mothering thing for the people because all they've known is bad fathering. See, all the stuff that these Pharisees have been doing is the same kind of stuff that bad dads do all the time. It's the stuff that says, I'm going to create some arbitrary rules that are sort of dumb, but at least there are rules. And so you got to do these rules. And if you don't do these rules, if you don't follow exactly these things, then you're in, you're in trouble. You know? and, and bad dads sometimes will do this kind of thing where they care more about the opinion of others about the family than about the heart and integrity of the family itself. And so the leaders of Jesus' day thought they needed to be that kind of authoritarian figures. They thought they needed to be the sort of people who would stand up and tell people what's right and what's wrong and what to do and what not to do. And to point their fingers at people. And Jesus says, no, they've already got a father. And he's pretty good. They need some mothering now. It still happens today. Churches, Christians, and religious people still today do the same things. I'm going to list off a bunch of things. You can just jot these down in the blanks there. Religious people still make up arbitrary rules. There's a certain time of the week and a certain thing you're supposed to do on that certain time of the week. And you all know that every Sunday morning you better be somewhere at a particular time or else you're going to get a phone call from someone later on. They're going to be like, hey man, I missed you at church this morning. And it's like, oh no, we don't actually do that. But... 
that's just because we're trying to do better than what these Pharisees were doing. But people do that all the time. Religious people create arbitrary rules for what you have to do and what you're not supposed to do. Number two, religious people still follow God's details, but forget the heart. We do it all the time. We'll tell people what the details are, but we forget the heart. Number three, religious people today still put reputation over integrity. I want people to think I'm religious whether or not I really am a follower of Jesus or not. Sometimes people will go to church on a Sunday morning or maybe go to a small group during the week simply because they don't want anyone around them to think that they're not really believing this stuff. It's the external, it's not integrity. Number four, religious people today still work against what I'm calling the Jesus life. The life of someone who just loves people and cares for people and supports them and tries to bring them to the Father. As Jesus looked at the people of his day, he saw what all the leaders were doing, acting like bad parents, being all righteous and uppity and legalistic. And Jesus in that venue says, all this religiosity can go out the window. What this city needs is some mothering. That's what he's saying. They didn't need more discipline. They didn't need more instruction. They didn't need more finger wagging. They just needed more mothering. And if the city of Jerusalem needed that in its day, I think Lafayette needs it today. I think your neighborhood needs it today. And we cannot be a church that allows ourselves to get into this frame of mind that does the stuff these Pharisees were doing. We cannot be a church that is part of that. We're going to be part of the solution. And so I want to ask you to write down a question. It goes like this under the take it home section. Just write this down. How can I mother my neighborhood? How can I mother my neighborhood. Okay, now I know some of you are dudes. And so I want to remind you that our Heavenly Father refers to Himself with masculine pronouns. He speaks to us from the perspective of a Father. And He tells us that He is our Father. And He's not ashamed of masculine pronouns. But here's the situation. Our Heavenly Father uses mothering metaphors when He's trying to connect with the people of His world that He loves so much. And so if you're a dude, be a dude like your dad and understand it's okay to do a little love. Do a little mothering. Figure out what this might mean in your context. Now, I don't know in your neighborhood, in your household, in your situation what this really means. That's because we're going to spend a few weeks trying to think through this. And the first step that we're going to learn next week is that we have to pray about this and get God to guide us on this. So I don't know exactly what it means for you in detail, but I know this. It begins with taking on the idea of what does it mean to be a great mom. And thank God for being that to you. And what does it mean to be a great mom? And ask God to help you do a little bit of that for the people in your life. The people around you. Starting with your neighbors. I want to invite us to spend a few minutes in reflection and ask for God to speak into our hearts. I'm not sure how God is going to answer that question for you, but let's spend some time listening to him. Would you pray with me? Thank you for listening to this message from Lafayette Community Church. We believe that God has a full and fulfilling life in store for you, and we want to help you live it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, Pastor Jeff, through the web form at lafayettecommunitychurch.com. And as always, I encourage you to plug into a solid, God-honoring community wherever you may be. Life is a journey, and no one should ever walk alone. Thank you.